live from the Bill Graham Auditorium in San Francisco. It's the Cube covering Pure Storage Accelerate 2018. Brought to you by Pure Storage. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Pure Storage Accelerate 2018. I'm Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante. We're at the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium and we are sporting some, you can't see mine because it's you? chilly. Who are you? I, I'm a symbol. <laughs> Right. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know. There's a name for that. I'm. I'm formerly known as Prince. <laughs> Dave and I are here with Rob Lee, the VP and Chief Architect at Pure Storage. Hey, Rob, welcome to the Cube. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're sporting a lot of gray. We won't make a comment. On this. I don't. I know. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a similar T-shirt either. Can't you haven't been kicked out. Like the venue just didn't actually eject you. You have to fix that. So you've been at Pure for about five years now. Um, you were one of the founders of Flashblade. Here we are, third annual Accelerate, packed house this morning in the keynote session. What are some of your observations about the growth that you've seen at this company? Well, you know, it's, it's really been amazing. Uh, you know, when I joined Pure, we were about 150 employees. I joined uh, as part of the founding team for Flashblade, one of the first two or three people. In fact, my first day on the job was taking monitors out of boxes and setting up desks. Uh, since then, you know, we've obviously grown tremendously from 150 employees to over 2,300. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, what we've been able to, to grow in terms of customers, right? So we've uh, went from that tiny size to over, I think, 4,800 customers today. Um, you know, from the Flashblade side of the house, uh, you know, it's been a really, really fun ride. Um, you know, the first couple years uh, of my time at Pure was spent really heads down uh, building the product, figuring out um, how do we repeat some of the, um, you know, kind of core philosophies and, and, and values that we brought to Flash Array uh, into Flashblade and, and take that product into new markets. Uh, we brought that product out and launched it uh, at our first Accelerate conference three years ago. Uh, so that first year was really about getting it out to market, growing that customer base. Um, last year, uh, you saw us take it into a lot, um, you know, a lot of more kind of uh, newer and emerging workloads, uh, you know, analytics, AI, so on and so forth. Uh, and this past year has really been spent uh, just doubling down on that and, and uh, not only uh, building a lot more expertise within the company about um, understanding uh, where that direction of the market is going, um, but also translating that experience that we're gathering, working with customers on the leading edge of all of those industries uh, into helping our, our customers, uh, you know, our, our, our new and, and prospective customers uh, figure out, you know, how, how do they, uh, deploy those solutions into their uh, uh, environments and, and be maximally successful. So it's really been a very, very exciting ride. So Rob, you're the kind of resident AI expert in, inside of uh, Pure, and I'm sure there are many, but you're on theCUBE now, so we want to unpack <laughs> that a little bit. Um, AI seems to be this emerging technology that's a you know, horizontal layer of tech that cuts across virtually every industry and in, in every application but its application seems to be you know, narrow, whether it's you know, facial recognition or natural language processing, supply chain optimization. So what's Pure's point of view on, on AI, artificial intelligence? I'm not crazy about the name. I like machine intelligence better personally, but what's your point of view on the AI space and some of the, how it will get adopted, maybe some of the barriers to that adoption? Sure. Well, so I think uh, so. I share the same. Uh, I share the same distaste for the for the term, uh, mostly because I think it, it it's overused and, and it's misused in many ways. Right. I think in in you know if you look at AI at its heart, it's really about gathering more intelligence and more value from data. Um, now, more recently, uh, uh, technology advances mostly in compute and algorithms um, have uh, caused and created an explosion in subsets of AI, particularly machine learning or deep learning. And that's really what's driving a lot of these new applications. And you mentioned a few image recognition, voice recognition, so on and so forth. Um, but really what it is, is it's re-highlighting a focus on the fact that you know, organizations for decades have been gathering and collecting and storing and paying to store or uh, volumes and volumes of data, uh, but they haven't been able to get the maximum value out of it. And I think um, one of the most chilling statistics I've, I've seen is that um, is, is that over 80% of data that's gathered is unstructured data. Um, but if you look at all of that unstructured data, less than 1% is actually analyzed, right? What that means is that 99% of the data that people have been collecting over the last de you know, several decades, they haven't been able to extract maximum value out of. And you know, I think what we're seeing is that the recent advances um, in, again, hardware technology, software technology, algorithms to drive a lot of these deep learning type of applications, um, even though they, the applications may be very uh, focused in terms of the types of data they work with, image recognition, object recognition, emotion detection, so on and so forth, um, it's, it's really 
bring the spotlight back uh, across organizations um, onto how do we get more information out of all of our data, right? And in a lot of cases, conversations that we get into with customers that start out with, you know, the you know, glitzy use cases, the, you know, object detection demos, um, you know, when we start peeling into, okay, well, so what is it, you know, how are you going to deploy this into your organization? How are you going to translate this into better customer outcomes? You know, we're actually finding ways to apply more traditional data analysis techniques um, uh, to get to get better and uh, more information out of people's data, and, and that may be you know everything from relational databases to uh, big data analytics stacks. Um, and so again, I think the the bigger movement here is that uh, recent advances in technology have really uh, re-highlighted a focus on um, organizations getting more uh, out of their data of all forms. When you think about the top market cap companies, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, at, at, at Google, etc. They seem to be companies that have mastered, or at least are ahead of the pack in terms of machine in intelligence. You guys recently conducted a study with MIT. What do you see from that study and in your conversations with customers in, t in terms of the incumbents being able to close that gap? So, you know, I, I think there are a couple of really interesting points that came up out of that, uh, out of the MIT uh, survey. Uh, one is that, you know, the prevalence uh, and demand for AI, and particularly machine learning um, applications, is both broad-based across all industries, but it's also huge. I think one of the stats that I saw was that over 80% of organizations expect to deploy into production uh, some form of AI or machine learning uh, technology into their companies by 2020. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing that wasn't in that survey, um, but uh, was in a set of remarks that Andrew Ang actually from Google made, was that um, is that the rapid pace of development in uh, AI research, and, and particularly the algorithm side, in terms of uh, you know different training frameworks and the way that people are working with data, um, that the rapid advance in that is actually democratizing entry into uh, into the AI space. That um, I, and I, I don't remember the exact uh, the quote, but but he said something to the effect of. Of, um, you know, as as algorithm research advances, it's easier and easier for new entrants to get into to machine learning, to get into data science, uh, and make a bigger and bigger impact. And I think that you know the other thing that, that we've learned from the large incumbents, right, is that um, in many cases, and, and I think actually Google was the one that came out and said this. They said um, the reason why. Google is at the head of the pack, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, data intelligence and machine intelligence. Um, in some, you know, in some respect, they got their lead by having you know the most advanced algorithms, most advanced software engineers. Um, but they maintain their lead because they have the most data, right? And, and, and you know, basically the takeaway point there is uh, having a lot of data trumps having you know having the best algorithm, and and we expect that to continue. Um, as as you know, uh, AI research and, and algorithms uh, continue to evolve, and so I think it's it's really um, in many ways it's much more democratized landscape uh, than uh, previous uh, you know previous approaches to, to. And a lot of that makes sense because because the incumbents, as we you know use that word, I like that word. They're going to buy AI from technology suppliers, and then they're going to apply it to their to their business. I mean, at the same time. Data generally is not at the core of, of their business. It tends to be either humans or maybe the bottling plant or some other you know, manufacturing assets or, or whatever it is. So they have to figure out the, the data model. And that study suggested that while they were optimistic about AI, they were struggling with trying to figure out you know, how to apply it, the skill sets, et, et, et cetera. Um, maybe share some of your thoughts on that. Absolutely, I think you know one of the things that that study really highlighted was that while there was a tremendous uh, excitement and demand from the upper levels of management, the CIO, the kind of C-suite to deploy AI technologies, uh, that there was an increasing and growing disconnect between uh, the, the kind of the policy decision makers, the you know the kind of executive management, and um, the people that are actually doing the work um, and and uh, working with it. And 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 I think that um, you know that that disconnect with this technology set um, is, is, we see it on a day-to-day -day basis. We see it with customers that we talk to. Um, and I think a lot of that disconnect actually comes from uh, uh, poor infrastructure planning, right? One of the things that we see is that many companies go, uh, you know, get really excited about the promise of AI technology, the promise of, you know, hey, I could, you know, deploy this solution, I could understand my customers better, great, let's go do it. Um, 
and they go off and they hire a bunch of data scientists without investing in or thinking about the infrastructure that they're going to put into place to make those data scientists productive. Um, and you know, one of the things that uh, I think there was an article in Financial Times uh, that actually looked at um, hiring and retention for data scientists, and what they found was that you know, there's what they found was that that the lack of infrastructure, the lack of automation, was materially contributing to frustration in terms of data scientists being able to do their jobs uh, to the point where it, you know, even though it's really, really hard to hire data scientists, it's becoming difficult to retain them if you're not giving them with a, you know, if you're not equipping them with the tools to do their jobs efficiently. Um, and so this is an area where, you know, um, there's a growing disconnect uh, between the decision makers that are saying, hey, we've got to go that way. Um, the, their understanding of the tool sets and the automation and the infrastructure that's required uh, to get there and their staffs and their employees that are actually responsible for getting them there. And, and this is an area where, you know, as we, you know, uh, one of the exciting uh, parts of my job at Pure is, you know, I get to talk to a lot of customers that are on the bleeding edge of implementing these uh, technologies. And um, one of the things that we get to do is that uh, by working with each of these customers, by uh, understanding what works, what doesn't work, um, you know, we can help kind of bridge that gap. I'll take the bait. Um, <laughs> so what does that infrastructure for AI look like? I mean, it's kind of self-serving, uh, but describe it. Sure, well, so I, I think at the heart of it, right, it's, it's all about simplicity, it's all about removing friction and bottlenecks, right? Um, there was a, a Harvard Business Review article a while ago that looked at uh, data science in general, uh, where time is spent, where uh, resources are spent, and uh, they came up with a statistic that said more than 80% of a data scientist's time is spent not doing data science, right? It's actually spent you know, preparing data, moving data, copying, you know, doing basic data wrangling, data, data management tasks, and the other 20% is spent complaining about the first 80%. <laughs> um, so, no, so, so I, I think what, you know, what we see, uh, you know, pure helping with, what we see kind of the ideal uh, kind of infrastructure to enable, um, uh, uh, you know, these types of projects is an infrastructure that is, uh, you know, simple, right, easy to work with, easy to manage, um, but more importantly, you heard, uh, you know, you heard Charlie and Kix during the keynote today talk about data-centric architectures, right? You heard them talk about the importance of building an architecture, building a practice, building a set of processes around the idea that data is very, very difficult to move. You want to move it as few, you know, as few times as possible. You want to manage it as, you know, as, as little as possible. Um, and, and that really, really applies in uh, a lot of these AI applications, right? Um, to give you a very, very quick example, if you take, you know, if you take a, a look at an AI pipeline to do something like uh, training an object det detection system for self-driving cars, you know, that, that pipeline, that, that simple sentence may encapsulate, you know, 30 or 40 different applications, right? You've got video coming off of video cameras that have to be ingested somewhere. That video has to be cut, downsized, rendered, you know, cut into still images. Those still images have to be warped, you know, uh, noise filters applied, color filters applied. You know, if you play this out, right, um, you know, in most cases there's 30, 40 different applications that are at play here. And without an infrastructure to make it easy to centralize the data management portion of that, you've also potentially got 30 or 40 different data silos. Um, and, and so, you know, when we look at how to make projects successful, when we look at how do you make infrastructure, you know, that helps data science teams spend more time doing data science and less time copying data around, tracking where it is, so on and so forth, um, you know, that's, that's all part of what we see as a larger data strategy, right? And, Oh, sorry, Rob. So one of the uh, customers that was shared on stage this morning, Page AI, and what they're, how they're leveraging, not just pure technology, but also really kind of taking what used to be, and still is for a lot of organizations, an analog process of actually looking at cancer pathology slides and digitizing that and taking it forward. Did you see in this study any, any leading um, industries that ha are maybe better positioned to to align the C-suite with the IT needs to take advantage of AI faster? Are there any industries that kind of jumped out in this study as maybe those that are going to be leading edge? So I think the thing um, I think the thing that actually jumped out was that uh, how broad based uh, across industries really the um, you know AI applications are. I think if you look at specific uh, types of data sets or specific use cases, right? So if you look at image detection, for example, um, yes, I think you can dr I, I think you can drive that into specific industries. I think you're going to see a lot uh, in healthcare, uh, in manufacturing. Um, certainly, self-driving cars is is a uh, is a big one, right? Um, uh, I think if 
you look at natural language processing, right, speech to text, that sort of thing, um, you know, a lot of uh, a customer service, right, that's being put into use in a lot of, uh, you know, automating a lot of chatbots and a lot of customer service uh, kind of uh, call center type applications. Um, so I think if you look at a particular application, right, a particular data set uh, or data type, you can drive that to industries that are likely to lead the charge. Um, but what was interesting to me was if you consider all of the machine learning approaches, all of the AI kind of um, uh, interest, uh, how broad based across all industries that was. At least I know we're out of time, but we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you what you guys are doing internally. You're not just selling a infrastructure for AI, you're AI practitioners as well. Can you briefly describe what you're doing? Sure, sure. Um, so I think the, the most interesting application of AI that we've got internally uh, is really the uh, AI engine that powers Meta, which is our, um, uh, our, our Pure One uh, hosted kind of uh, <laughs> our, our Pure One uh, offering that uh, helps us predictively and proactively manage customer arrays. Um, you know, we started uh, Pure One as a uh, remote support offering uh, since the beginning of Pure, since uh, since we first shipped Flash Array, and we and we did it originally um, to get to the point where where we could better understand arrays. The more the more arrays that we ship in the field, uh, we want the marginal cost of support, the marginal uh, kind of uh, effort, if you will, to understand that arrays behavior to decrease with the number of arrays that we ship, and we want our understanding of the arrays behavior of the you know customer use case of the workload behavior to increase with the, with the, uh, the number of arrays that we ship. And we started off um, you know, by using more traditional AI techniques, right? Um, so basic language processing, basic statistics, so on and so forth. Um, what we've since done is, is built, a, uh, uh, built a machine learning engine behind it uh, so that we can make more intelligent uh, uh, inferences, more intelligent um, decisions. And so uh, you've seen this uh, come out as uh, in the form of tools that we've released, such as Will It Fit, right? So uh, we can now take a look at an array and we could say, okay, well, you've got this many, you know, workloads, you know, you've got, you've got this many VMs sitting on this array and on this volume. Um, what would it look like to put double that, right? What can you expect in terms of capacity utilization? What can you expect in terms of uh, performance? Um, we can also take that to, uh, uh, we can take that hypo hypothetical kind of hypothesis analysis to different hardware platforms. We can say, hey, you've got this workload running on you know, a X50 today. What would it look like to double that workload and move it to an X70? What, what would that look like? And, um, and again, a lot of those inferences, a lot of, uh, you know, we can do that without exactly tracking and exactly testing that workload because we have a broad-based uh, set of uh, data points across our entire fleet. Too complicated for humans to do all that. It really <laughs> yes, is. Yes, it really is, yeah. But generating workload DNA. Work, exactly, exactly. And, and more importantly, and, and to get to David's point, right, more importantly, doing it in an automated way so that you don't have to put an army of human beings, an army of administrators behind it um, to calculate it by hand. Well, Rob, thanks so much for stopping by theCUBE and sharing with us what's going on from your perspective. Go get some orange. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me. For Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE. We are live at Pure Storage Accelerate 2018 in San Francisco. Stick around, Dave and I will be right back with our next guest.